Section 25 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray. Section 25. Ethmoid Bone. Os ethmoidale. The ethmoid bone is exceedingly light and spongy, and cubical in shape. It is situated at the anterior part of the base of the cranium, between the two orbits, at the roof of the nose, and contributes to each of these cavities. It consists of four parts, a horizontal or cribriform plate, forming part of the base of the cranium, a perpendicular plate, constituting part of the nasal septum, and two lateral masses or labyrinths. Cribriform plate, lamina cribrosa, horizontal lamina. The cribriform plate is received into the ethmoidal notch of the frontal bone and roofs in the nasal cavities. Projecting upward from the middle line of this plate is a thick, smooth, triangular process, the cristagalli, so called from its resemblance to a coxcomb. The long, thin, posterior border of the cristagalli serves for the attachment of the fox cerebri. Its anterior border, short and thick, articulates with the frontal bone, and presents two small projecting alli, which are received into corresponding depressions in the frontal bone, and complete the foramen cecum. Its sides are smooth, and sometimes bulging from the presence of a small air sinus in the interior. On either side of the cristagalli, the cribriform plate is narrow and deeply grooved. It supports the olfactory bulb and is perforated by foramina for the passage of the olfactory nerves. The foramina in the middle of the groove are small and transmit the nerves to the roof of the nasal cavity. Those at the medial and lateral parts of the groove are larger. The former transmit the nerves to the upper part of the nasal septum, the latter those to the superior nasal concha. At the front part of the cribriform plate, on either side of the cristagalli, is a small fissure which is occupied by a process of dura mater. Lateral to this fissure is a notch or foramen which transmits the nasociliary nerve. From this notch a groove extends backward to the anterior ethmoidal foramen. Perpendicular plate, lamina perpendicularis, vertical plate. The perpendicular plate is a thin, flattened lamina, polygonal in form, which descends from the under surface of the cribriform plate and assists in forming the septum of the nose. It is generally deflected a little to one or the other side. The anterior border articulates with the spine of the frontal bone and the crest of the nasal bones. The posterior border articulates by its upper half with the sphenoidal crest, by its lower with the vomer. The inferior border is thicker than the posterior, and serves for the attachment of the septal cartilage of the nose. The surfaces of the plate are smooth, except above, where numerous grooves and canals are seen. These lead from the medial foramina on the cribriform plate, and lodge filaments of the olfactory nerves. The labyrinth or lateral mass, labyrinthus ethmoidalis, consists of a number of thin-walled cellular cavities, the ethmoidal cells, arranged in three groups, anterior, middle, and posterior, and interposed between two vertical plates of bone. The lateral plate forms part of the orbit, the medial part of the corresponding nasal cavity. In the disarticulated bone, many of these cells are opened into, but when the bones are articulated, they are closed in at every part, except where they open into the nasal cavity. Surfaces the upper surface of the labyrinth presents a number of half-broken cells, the walls of which are completed, in the articulated skull, by the edges of the ethmoidal notch of the frontal bone. Crossing this surface are two grooves, converted into canals by articulation with the frontal. They are the anterior and posterior ethmoidal canals, and open on the inner wall of the orbit. The posterior surface presents large irregular cellular cavities, which are closed in by articulation with the sphenoidal concha and orbital process of the palatine. The lateral surface is formed of a thin, smooth, oblong plate, the lamina papyracea, os planum, which covers in the middle and posterior ethmoidal cells, and forms a large part of the medial wall of the orbit. It articulates above with the orbital plate of the frontal bone, below with the maxilla and orbital process of the palatine. 
in front with the lacrimal, and behind with the sphenoid. In front of the lamina papyracea are some broken air cells which are overlapped and completed by the lacrimal bone and the frontal process of the maxilla. A curved lamina, the uncinate process, projects downward and backward from this part of the labyrinth. It forms a small part of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus and articulates with the ethmoidal process of the inferior nasal concha. The medial surface of the labyrinth forms part of the lateral wall of the corresponding nasal cavity. It consists of a thin lamella which descends from the under surface of the cribriform plate and ends below in a free, convoluted margin, the middle nasal concha. It is rough and marked above by numerous grooves directed nearly vertically downward from the cribriform plate. They lodge branches of the olfactory nerves, which are distributed to the mucous membrane covering the superior nasal concha. The back part of the surface is subdivided by a narrow, oblique fissure, the superior meatus of the nose, bounded above by a thin, curved plate, the superior nasal concha. The posterior ethmoidal cells open into this meatus. Below and in front of the superior meatus is the convex surface of the middle nasal concha. It extends along the whole length of the medial surface of the labyrinth, and its lower margin is free and thick. The lateral surface of the middle concha is concave, and assists in forming the middle meatus of the nose. The middle ethmoidal cells open into the central part of this meatus, and a sinuous passage, termed the infundibulum, extends upward and forward through the labyrinth and communicates with the anterior ethmoidal cells, and in about fifty per cent of skulls is continued upward as the frontonasal duct into the frontal sinus. Ossification. The ethmoid is ossified in the cartilage of the nasal capsule by three centers, one for the perpendicular plate and one for each labyrinth. The labyrinths are first developed, ossific granules making their appearance in the region of the lamina papyracea between the fourth and fifth months of fetal life and extending into the concha. At birth, the bone consists of the two labyrinths, which are small and ill-developed. During the first year after birth, the perpendicular plate and cristagalli begin to ossify from a single center, and are joined to the labyrinths, about the beginning of the second year. The cribriform plate is ossified partly from the perpendicular plate, and partly from the labyrinths. The development of the ethmoidal cells begins during fetal life. Articulations the ethmoid articulates with fifteen bones, four of the cranium, the frontal, the sphenoid, and the two sphenoidal conchi, and eleven of the face, the two nasals, two maxillae, two lacrimals, two palatines, two inferior nasal conchi, and the vomer. Sutural or Wormian Bones Footnote Ole Wurm, professor of anatomy at Copenhagen, 1624 to 1639, was erroneously supposed to have given the first detailed description of these bones. End footnote. In addition to the usual centers of ossification of the cranium, others may occur in the course of the sutures, giving rise to irregular, isolated bones termed sutural or wormian bones. They occur most frequently in the course of the lambdoidal suture, but are occasionally seen at the fontanelles, especially the posterior. One, the terion ossicle, sometimes exists between the sphenoidal angle of the parietal and the great wing of the sphenoid. They have a tendency to be more or less symmetrical on the two sides of the skull, and vary much in size. Their number is generally limited to two or three, but more than a hundred have been found in the skull of an adult hydrocephalic subject. End of section 25. Twenty-six of Gray's Anatomy, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray. 5b. The facial bones. 1. The nasal bones. Ossa facii and ossa nasalia. The nasal bones are two small oblong bones, 
varying in size and form in different individuals. They are placed side by side at the middle and upper part of the face, and form, by their junction, the bridge of the nose. Each has two surfaces and four borders. Surfaces The outer surface is concavo-convex from above downward, convex from side to side. It is covered by the proxerus and compressor naris, and perforated about its centre by a foramen, for the transmission of a small vein. The inner surface is concave from side to side, and is traversed from above downward, by a groove for the passage of a branch of the nasociliary nerve. Borders The superior border is narrow, thick, and serrated for articulation with the nasal notch of the frontal bone. The inferior border is thin, and gives attachment to the lateral cartilage of the nose. Near its middle is a notch which marks the end of the groove just referred to. The lateral border is serrated, beveled at the expense of the inner surface above, and of the outer below, to articulate with the frontal process of the maxilla. The medial border, thicker above than below, articulates with its fellow of the opposite side, and is prolonged behind into a vertical crest, which forms part of the nasal septum. This crest articulates, from above downward, with the spine of the frontal, the perpendicular plane of the ethmoid, and the septal cartilage of the nose. Ossification. Each bone is ossified from one centre, which appears at the beginning of the third month of fetal life in the membrane overlying the front part of the cartilaginous nasal capsule. Articulations. The nasal articulates with four bones, two of the cranium, the frontal and ethmoid, and two of the face, the opposite nasal and the maxilla. 5b2, the maxillae, upper jaw. The maxillae are the largest bones of the face, excepting the mandible, and form, by their union, the whole of the upper jaw. Each assists in forming the boundaries of three cavities, viz. the roof of the mouth, the floor and lateral wall of the nose, and the floor of the orbit. It also enters into the formation of two fossae, the infratemporal and pterygopalatine, and two fissures, the inferior orbital and pterygomaxillary. Each bone consists of a body and four processes, zygomatic, frontal, alveolar, and palatine. The body, corpus maxillae. The body is somewhat pyramidal in shape, and contains a large cavity, the maxillary sinus, antrum of hymore. It has four surfaces, an anterior, a posterior or infratemporal, a superior or orbital, and a medial or nasal. Surfaces. The anterior surface is directed forward and lateralward. It presents at its lower part a series of eminences corresponding to the positions of the roots of the teeth. Just above those of the incisor teeth is a depression, the incisive fossa, which gives origin to the depressor ally nasi. The alveolar border below the fossa is attached a slip of the orbicularis oris. Above and a little lateral to it, the nasalis arises. Lateral to the incisive fossa is another depression, the canine fossa. It is larger and deeper than the incisive fossa, and is separated from it by a vertical ridge, the canine eminence, corresponding to the socket of the canine tooth, and the canine fossa gives origin to the caninus. Above the fossa is the infraorbital foramen, the end of the infraorbital canal, which transmits the infraorbital vessels and nerve. Above the foramen is the margin of the orbit, which affords attachment to part of the quadratus labii superioris. Medially, the anterior surface is limited by a deep concavity, the nasal notch, the margin of which gives attachment to the dilator naris posterior, and ends below an appointed process, which with its fellow of the opposite side forms the anterior nasal spine. The infratemporal surface is convex, directed backward and lateralward, and forms part of the infratemporal fossa. It is separated from the anterior surface by the zygomatic process and by a strong ridge, extending upward from the socket of the first molar tooth. It is pierced about its centre by the apertures of the alveolar canals, which transmit the posterior superior alveolar vessels and nerves. At the lower part of this surface is a rounded eminence, the maxillary tuberosity, especially prominent after the growth of the wisdom tooth.
It is rough on the lateral side for articulation with the pyramidal process of the palatine bone, and in some cases articulates with the lateral pterygoid plate of the sphenoid. It gives origin to a few fibres of the pterygoideus internus. Immediately above this is a smooth surface, which forms the anterior boundary of the pterygopalatine fossa, and presents a groove for the maxillary nerve. This groove is directed lateralward and slightly upward, and is continuous with the infraorbital groove on the orbital surface. The orbital surface is smooth and triangular, and forms the greater part of the floor of the orbit. It is bounded medially by an irregular margin which in front presents a notch, the lacrimal notch. Behind this notch the margin articulates with the lacrimal, the lamina papyracea of the ethmoid, and the orbital process of the palatine. It is bounded behind by a smooth rounded edge which forms the anterior margin of the inferior orbital fissure, and sometimes articulates at its lateral extremity with the orbital surface of the great wing of the sphenoid. It is limited in front by part of the circumference of the orbit, which is continuous medially with the frontal process, and laterally with the zygomatic process. Near the middle of the posterior part of the orbital surface is the infraorbital groove, for the passage of the infraorbital vessels and nerve. The groove begins at the middle of the posterior border, where it is continuous with that near the upper edge of the infratemporal surface, and passing forward ends in a canal which subdivides into two branches. One of the canals, the infraorbital canal, opens just below the margin of the orbit. The other, which is smaller, runs downward in the substance of the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus, and transmits the anterior superior alveolar vessels and nerve to the front teeth of the maxilla. From the back part of the infraorbital canal, a second small canal is sometimes given off. It runs downward in the lateral wall of the sinus, and conveys the middle alveolar nerve to the premolar teeth. At the medial and fore part of the orbital surface, just lateral to the lacrimal groove, is a depression, which gives origin to the obliquous oculi inferior. The nasal surface presents a large irregular opening leading into the maxillary sinus. At the upper border of this aperture are some broken air cells, which in the articulated skull are closed in by the ethmoid and lacrimal bones. Below the aperture is a smooth concavity which forms part of the inferior meatus of the nasal cavity, and behind it is a rough surface for articulation with the perpendicular part of the palatine bone. This surface is traversed by a groove commencing near the middle of the posterior border and running obliquely downward and forward. The groove is converted into a canal, the pterygopalatine canal, by the palatine bone. In front of the opening of the sinus is a deep groove, the lacrimal groove, which is converted into the nasal lacrimal canal by the lacrimal bone and inferior nasal concha. This canal opens into the inferior meatus of the nose and transmits the nasal lacrimal duct. More anteriorly is an oblique ridge, the conchal crest, for articulation with the inferior nasal concha. The shallow concavity above this ridge forms part of the atrium of the middle meatus of the nose, and that below it part of the inferior meatus. The maxillary sinus, or antrum of hymor, sinus maxillaris. The maxillary sinus is a large pyramidal cavity within the body of the maxilla. Its apex, directed lateralward, is formed by the zygomatic process. Its base, directed medialward, by the lateral wall of the nose. Its walls are everywhere exceedingly thin and correspond to the nasal orbit, anterior and infratemporal surfaces of the body of the bone. Its nasal wall or base presents, in the disarticulated bone, a large irregular aperture communicating with the nasal cavity. In the articulated skull, this aperture is much reduced in size by the following bones. The uncinate process of the ethmoid bone, the ethmoidal process of the inferior nasal concha below, the vertical part of the palatine behind, and a small part of the lacrimal above and in front. The sinus communicates with the middle meatus of the nose, generally by two small apertures left between the above-mentioned bones. In the fresh state, usually only one small opening exists, near the upper part of the cavity. The other is closed by mucous membrane. On the posterior wall are the alveolar canals, transmitting the posterior superior alveolar vessels and nerves to the molar teeth. The floor is formed by the alveolar process of the maxilla,
and if the sinus be of an average size, is on a level with the floor of the nose. If the sinus be large, it reaches below this level. Projecting into the floor of the antrum are several conical processes, corresponding to the roots of the first and second molar teeth. In some case, the floor is perforated by the fangs of the teeth. The infraorbital canal usually projects into the cavity as a well-marked ridge extending from the roof to the anterior wall. Additional ridges are sometimes seen in the posterior wall of the cavity and are caused by the alveolar canals. The size of the cavity varies in different skulls, and even on the two sides of the same skull. The zygomatic process. Processus zygomaticus, malar process. The zygomatic process is a rough triangular eminence situated at the angle of separation of the anterior, zygomatic and orbital surfaces. In front it forms part of the anterior surface, behind it is concave and forms part of the infratemporal fossa. Above it is rough and serrated for articulation with the zygomatic bone, while below it presents the prominent arched border which marks the division between the anterior and infratemporal surfaces. The frontal process, processus frontalis, nasal process. The frontal process is a strong plate which projects upward, medialward and backwards by the side of the nose, forming part of its lateral boundary. Its lateral surface is smooth, continuous with the anterior surface of the body, and gives attachment to the quadratus labii superioris, the orbicularis oculi and the medial palpebral ligament. Its medial surface forms part of the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. At its upper part is a rough, uneven area, which articulates with the ethmoid, closing in the anterior ethmoidal cells. Below this is an oblique ridge, the ethmoidal crest, the posterior end of which articulates with the middle nasal concha, while the anterior part is termed the agonaceae. The crest forms the upper limit of the atrium of the middle meatus. The upper border articulates with the frontal bone and the anterior with the nasal. The posterior border is thick and hollowed into a groove, which is continuous below with the lacrimal groove on the nasal surface of the body. By the articulation of the medial margin of the groove with the anterior border of the lacrimal, a corresponding groove on the lacrimal is brought into continuity, and together they form the lacrimal fossa for the lodgment of the lacrimal sac. The lateral margin of the groove is named the anterior lacrimal crest, and continues below with the orbital margin. At its junction with the orbital surface is a small tubercle, the lacrimal tubercle, which serves as a guide to the position of the lacrimal sac. The alveolar process, processus alveolaris. The alveolar process is the thickest and most spongy part of the bone. It is broader behind than in front, and excavated into deep cavities for the reception of the teeth. These cavities are eight in number and vary in size and depth according to the teeth they contain. That for the canine tooth is the deepest. Those for the molars are the widest and are subdivided into minor cavities by septa. Those for the incisors are single, but deep and narrow. The buccinator arises from the outer surface of this process, as far forward as the first molar tooth. When the maxillae are articulated with each other, their alveolar processes together form the alveolar arch. The center of the anterior margin of this arch is named the alveolar point. The palatine process. Processus palatinus, palatal process. The palatine process, thick and strong, is horizontal and projects medialward from the nasal surface of the bone. It forms a considerable part of the floor of the nose and the roof of the mouth and is much thicker in front than behind. Its inferior surface is concave, rough and uneven, and forms, with the palatine process of the opposite bone, the anterior three-fourths of the hard plate. It is perforated by numerous foramina for the passage of the nutrient vessels is channelled at the back part of its lateral border by a groove, sometimes a canal, for the transmission of the descending palatine vessels and the anterior palatine nerve from the sphenopalatine ganglion, and presents little depressions for the lodgment of the palatine glands. When the two maxillae are articulated, a funnel-shaped opening, the incisive foramen, is seen in the middle line, immediately behind the incisor teeth. In this opening, the orifices of two lateral canals are visible. They are named the incisive canals or foramina of Stenson. Through each of them passes the terminal branch of the descending palatine artery and the nasopalatine nerve. Occasionally two additional canals are present in the middle line. They are termed the foramina of Scarpa 
and when present transmit the nasopalatine nerves, the left passing through the anterior and the right through the posterior canal. On the undersurface of the palatine process, a delicate linear suture, well seen in young skulls, may sometimes be noticed extending lateralward and forward on either side from the incisive foramen to the interval between the lateral incisor and the canine tooth. The small part in front of this suture constitutes the premaxilla, or incisivum, which in most vertebrates forms an independent bone. It includes the whole thickness of the alveolus, the corresponding part of the floor of the nose and the anterior nasal spine, and contains the sockets of the incisor teeth. The upper surface of the palatine process is concave from side to side, smooth, and forms the greater part of the floor of the nasal cavity. It presents, close to its medial margin, the upper orifice of the incisive canal. The lateral border of the process is incorporated with the rest of the bone. The medial border is thicker in front than behind, and is raised above into a ridge, the nasal crest, which, with the corresponding ridge of the opposite bone, forms a groove for the reception of the vomer. The front part of this ridge rises to a considerable height and is named the incisor crest. It is prolonged forward into a sharp process, which forms, together with a similar process of the opposite bone, the anterior nasal spine. The posterior border is serrated for articulation with the horizontal part of the palatine bone. Ossification The maxilla is ossified in membrane. Mull and Fawcett maintain that it is ossified from two centres only, one for the maxilla proper and one for the premaxilla. These centres appear during the sixth week of fetal life and unite in the beginning of the third month, but the suture between the two portions persists on the palate until nearly middle life. Mall states that the frontal process is developed from both centres. The maxillary sinus appears as a shallow groove on the nasal surface of the bone about the fourth month of fetal life, but does not reach its full size until after the second dentition. The maxilla was formerly described as ossifying from six centres, viz. 1. The orbiter nasal forms that part of the body of the bone which lies medial to the infraorbital canal, including the medial part of the floor of the orbit and the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. A second, the zygomatic, gives origin to the portion which lies lateral to the infraorbital canal, including the zygomatic process. From the third, the palatine, is developed the palatine process posterior to the incisive canal together with the adjoining part of the nasal wall. A fourth, the premaxillary, forms the incisive bone which carries the incisor teeth and corresponds to the premaxilla of the lower vertebrates. Some anatomists believe that the premaxillary bone is ossified by two centers. A fifth, the nasal, gives rise to the frontal process and the portion above the canine tooth. And a sixth, the infravomerine, lies between the palatine and the premaxillary centres and beneath the vomer. vomer. This centre, together with the corresponding centre of the opposite bone, separates the incisive canals from each other. Articulations The maxilla articulates with nine bones, two of the cranium, the frontal and ethmoid, and seven of the face, viz. the nasal, zygomatic, lacrimal, inferior nasal concha, palatine, vomer, and its fellow of the opposite side. Sometimes it articulates with the orbital surface, and sometimes with the lateral pterygoid plate of the sphenoid. Changes produced in the maxilla by age. At birth, the transverse and anteroposterior diameters of the bone are each greater than the vertical. The frontal process is well marked, and the body of the bone consists of little more than the alveolar process, the teeth sockets reaching almost to the floor of the orbit. The maxillary sinus presents the appearance of a furrow on the lateral wall of the nose. In the adult, the vertical diameter is the greatest, owing to the development of the alveolar process and the increase in size of the sinus. In old age, the bone reverts in some measure to the infantile condition. Its height is diminished, and after the loss of the teeth, the alveolar process is absorbed, and the lower part of the bone contracted and reduced in thickness. End of section 26section twenty seven of gray's anatomy part one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org anatomy of the human body part one by henry gray the lacrimal bone 
os lacrimale. The lacrimal bone, the smallest and most fragile bone of the face, is situated at the front part of the medial wall of the orbit. It has two surfaces and four borders. Surfaces The lateral or orbital surface is divided by a vertical ridge, the posterior lacrimal crest, into two parts. In front of this crest is a longitudinal groove, the lacrimal sulcus, sulcus lacrimalis, the inner margin of which unites with the frontal process of the maxilla, and the lacrimal fossa is thus completed. The upper part of this fossa lodges the lacrimal sac, the lower part the nasolacrimal duct. The portion behind the crest is smooth, and forms part of the medial wall of the orbit. The crest, with a part of the orbital surface immediately behind it, gives origin to the lacrimal part of the orbicularis oculi, and ends below in a small hook-like projection, the lacrimal hamulus, which articulates with the lacrimal tubercle of the maxilla, and completes the upper orifice of the lacrimal canal. It sometimes exists as a separate piece, and is then called the lesser lacrimal bone. The medial or nasal surface presents a longitudinal furrow corresponding to the crest on the lateral surface. The area in front of this furrow forms part of the middle maiatus of the nose, that behind it articulates with the ethmoid and completes some of the anterior ethmoidal cells. Borders Of the four borders, the anterior articulates with the frontal process of the maxilla, the posterior with the lamina papyracea of the ethmoid, the superior with the frontal bone. The inferior is divided by the lower edge of the posterior lacrimal crest into two parts. The posterior part articulates with the orbital plate of the maxilla. The anterior is prolonged downwards as the descending process, which articulates with the lacrimal process of the inferior nasal concha and assists in forming the canal for the nasolacrimal duct. Ossification The lacrimal is ossified from a single centre, which appears about the twelfth week in the membrane covering the cartilaginous nasal capsule. Articulations The lacrimal articulates with four bones, two of the cranium, the frontal and ethmoid, and two of the face, the maxilla, and the inferior nasal concha. The zygomatic bone, os zygomaticum, malar bone. The zygomatic bone is small and quadrangular, and is situated at the upper and lateral part of the face. It forms the prominence of the cheek, part of the lateral wall and floor of the orbit, and parts of the temporal and infratemporal fossae. It presents a malar and a temporal surface. Four processes, the frontosphenoidal, orbital, maxillary and temporal, and four borders. Surfaces The malar surface is convex and perforated near its centre by a small aperture. The zygomaticofacial foramen, for the passage of the zygomaticofacial nerve and vessels. Below this foramen is a slight elevation, which gives origin to the zygomaticus. The temporal surface, directed backward and medialward, is concave, presenting medially a rough triangular area for articulation with the maxilla, and laterally a smooth concave surface, the upper part of which forms the anterior boundary of the temporal fossa, the lower a part of the infratemporal fossa. Near the centre of this surface is the zygomaticotemporal foramen, for the transmission of the zygomaticotemporal nerve. Processes The frontosphenoidal process is thick and serrated, and articulates with the zygomatic process of the frontal bone. On its orbital surface, just within the orbital margin, and about 11 mm below the zygomaticofrontal suture, is a tubercle of varying size and form, but present in 95% of skulls. 
The orbital process is a thick, strong plate, projecting backward and medialward from the orbital margin. Its anteromedial surface forms, by its junction with the orbital surface of the maxilla and with the great wing of the sphenoid, part of the floor and lateral wall of the orbit. On it are seen the orifices of two canals, the zygomatico-orbital foramina. One of these canals opens into the temporal fossa, the other on the malar surface of the bone. The former transmits the zygomatico-temporal, the latter the zygomatico-facial nerve. Its posterolateral surface, smooth and convex, forms part of the temporal and infratemporal fossae. Its anterior margin, smooth and rounded, is part of the circumference of the orbit. Its superior margin, rough and directed horizontally, articulates with the frontal bone behind the zygomatic process. Its posterior margin is serrated for articulation with the great wing of the sphenoid and the orbital surface of the maxilla. At the angle of junction of the sphenoidal and maxillary portions, a short, concave, non-articular part is generally seen. This forms the anterior boundary of the inferior orbital fissure. Occasionally, this non-articular part is absent, the fissure then being completed by the junction of the maxilla and sphenoid, or by the interposition of a small sutural bone in the angular interval between them. The maxillary process presents a rough triangular surface which articulates with the maxilla. The temporal process, long, narrow and serrated, articulates with the zygomatic process of the temporal. Borders The anterosuperior or orbital border is smooth, concave and forms a considerable part of the circumference of the orbit. The antero-inferior or maxillary border is rough and bevelled at the expense of its inner table, to articulate with the maxilla. Near the orbital margin it gives origin to the quadratus labii superioris. The postero superior, or temporal border, curved like an italic letter F, is continuous above with the commencement of the temporal line, and below with the upper border of the zygomatic arch. The temporal fascia is attached to it. The postero inferior or zygomatic border affords attachment by its rough edge to the masseter. Ossification The zygomatic bone is generally described as ossifying from three centres, one for the malar and two for the orbital portion. These appear about the eighth week and fuse about the fifth month of fetal life. Mal describes it as being ossified from one centre which appears just beneath and to the lateral side of the orbit. After birth, the bone is sometimes divided by a horizontal suture into an upper larger and a lower smaller division. In some quadrumana, the zygomatic bone consists of two parts, an orbital and a malar. Articulations The zygomatic articulates with four bones the frontal, sphenoidal, temporal, and maxilla. End of section 27。section 28 of Grey's Anatomy part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray The Palatine Bone Os Palatinum Palate Bone The Palatine Bone is situated at the back part of the nasal cavity, between the maxilla and the pterygoid process of the sphenoid. It contributes to the walls of three cavities, the floor and lateral wall of the nasal cavity, the roof of the mouth, and the floor of the orbit. It enters into the formation of two fossae, the pterygopalatine and the pterygoid fossae, and one fissure, the inferior orbital fissure. 
The palatine bone somewhat resembles the letter L, and consists of a horizontal and a vertical part, and three outstanding processes, viz. the pyramidal process, which is directed backward and lateralward from the junction of the two parts, and the orbital and sphenoidal processes, which surmount the vertical part, and are separated by a deep notch, the sphenopalatine notch. The horizontal part, pars horizontalis, horizontal plate. The horizontal part is quadrilateral, and has two surfaces and four borders. Surfaces. The superior surface, concave from side to side, forms the back part of the floor of the nasal cavity. The inferior surface, slightly concave and rough, forms, with the corresponding surface of the opposite bone, the posterior fourth of the hard palate. Near its posterior margin may be seen a more or less marked transverse ridge for the attachment of part of the aponeurosis of the tensor veli palatini. Borders the anterior border is serrated and articulates with the palatine process of the maxilla. The posterior border is concave, free, and serves for the attachment of the soft palate. Its medial end is sharp and pointed, and when united with that of the opposite bone, forms a projecting process, the posterior nasal spine, for the attachment of the musculus uvulae. The lateral border is united with the lower margin of the perpendicular part, and is grooved by the lower end of the pterygopalatine canal. The medial border, the thickest, is serrated for articulation with its fellow of the opposite side. Its superior edge is raised into a ridge, which, united with the ridge of the opposite bone, forms the nasal crest, for articulation with the posterior part of the lower edge of the vulma. The vertical part. Pars perpendicularis, perpendicular plate. The vertical part is thin, of an oblong form, and presents two surfaces and four borders. Surfaces. The nasal surface exhibits at its lower part a broad, shallow depression, which forms part of the inferior meatus of the nose. Immediately above this is a well-marked horizontal ridge, the conchal crest, for articulation with the inferior nasal concha. Still higher is a second broad, shallow depression, which forms part of the middle meatus, and is limited above by a horizontal crest less prominent than the inferior, the ethmoidal crest, for articulation with the middle nasal concha. Above the ethmoidal crest is a narrow horizontal groove, which forms part of the superior meatus. The maxillary surface is rough and irregular throughout the greater part of its extent, for articulation with the nasal surface of the maxilla. Its upper and back part is smooth where it enters into the formation of the pterygopalatine fossa. It is also smooth in front, where it forms the posterior part of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus. On the posterior part of this surface is a deep vertical groove, converted into the pterygopalatine canal by articulation with the maxilla. This canal transmits the descending palatine vessels and the anterior palatine nerve. Borders The anterior border is thin and irregular. Opposite the conchal crest is a pointed projecting lamina, the maxillary process, which is directed forward and closes in the lower and back part of the opening of the maxillary sinus. The posterior border presents a deep groove, the edges of which are serrated for articulation with the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid. This border is continuous above with the sphenoidal process. Below it expands into the pyramidal process. The superior border supports the orbital process in front and the sphenoidal process behind. These processes are separated by the sphenopalatine notch, which is converted into the sphenopalatine foramen 
by the under surface of the body of the sphenoid. In the articulated skull, this foramen leads from the pterygopalatine fossa into the posterior part of the superior meatus of the nose, and transmits the sphenopalatine vessels, and the superior nasal and nasopalatine nerves. The inferior border is fused with the lateral edge of the horizontal part, and immediately in front of the pyramidal process is grooved by the lower end of the pterygopalatine canal. The pyramidal process or tuberosity. Processus pyramidalis. The pyramidal process projects backward and lateralward from the junction of the horizontal and vertical parts, and is received into the angular interval between the lower extremities of the pterygoid plates. On its posterior surface is a smooth grooved triangular area, limited on either side by a rough articular furrow. The furrows articulate with the pterygoid plates, while the grooved intermediate area completes the lower part of the pterygoid fossa and gives origin to a few fibres of the pterygoideus internus. The anterior part of the lateral surface is rough for articulation with the tuberosity of the maxilla. Its posterior part consists of a smooth triangular area, which appears in the articulated skull between the tuberosity of the maxilla and the lower part of the lateral pterygoid plate, and completes the lower part of the infratemporal fossa. On the base of the pyramidal process, close to its union with the horizontal part, are the lesser palatine foramina, for the transmission of the posterior and middle palatine nerves. The orbital process, processus orbitalis. The orbital process is placed on a higher level than the sphenoidal, and is directed upward and lateralward from the front of the vertical part, to which it is connected by a constricted neck. It presents five surfaces which enclose an air cell, of these surfaces, three are articular and two non-articular. The articular surfaces are 1. The anterior or maxillary, directed forward, lateralward and downward, of an oblong form and rough for articulation with the maxilla. 2. The posterior or sphenoidal, directed backward, upward and medialward. It presents the opening of the air cell, which usually communicates with the sphenoidal sinus. The margins of the opening are serrated for articulation with the sphenoidal concha. 3. The medial, or ethmoidal, directed forward, articulates with the labyrinth of the ethmoid. In some cases, the air cell opens on this surface of the bone, and then communicates with the posterior ethmoidal cells. More rarely it opens on both surfaces, and then communicates with the posterior ethmoidal cells and the sphenoidal sinus. The non-articular surfaces are 1. The superior or orbital, directed upward and lateralward. It is triangular in shape, and forms the back part of the floor of the orbit, and 2. The lateral, of an oblong form, directed toward the pterygopalatine fossa. It is separated from the orbital surface by a rounded border, which enters into the formation of the inferior orbital fissure. The sphenoidal process. Processus sphenoidalis. The sphenoidal process is a thin, compressed plate, much smaller than the orbital, and directed upward and medialward. It presents three surfaces and two borders. The superior surface articulates with the root of the pterygoid process and the undersurface of the sphenoidal concha, its medial border reaching as far as the ala of the vomma. It presents a groove which contributes to the formation of the pharyngeal canal. The medial surface is concave and forms part of the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. The lateral surface is divided into an articular and a non-articular portion. The former is rough, for articulation with the medial pterygoid plate. The latter is smooth, and forms part of the pterygopalatine fossa. 
The anterior border forms the posterior boundary of the Svenopalatine notch. The posterior border, serrated at the expense of the outer table, articulates with the medial pterygoid plate. The orbital and sphenoidal processes are separated from one another by the Svenopalatine notch. Sometimes the two processes are united above and form between them a complete foramen, or the notch may be crossed by one or more spicules of bone, giving rise to two or more foramina. Ossification The palatine bone is ossified in membrane from a single centre, which makes its appearance about the sixth or eighth week of fetal life at the angle of junction of the two parts of the bone. From this point, ossification spreads medialward to the horizontal part, downward into the pyramidal process, and upward into the vertical part. Some authorities describe the bone as ossifying from four centres, one for the pyramidal process and portion of the vertical part behind the pterygopalatine groove, a second for the rest of the vertical and the horizontal parts, a third for the orbital, and a fourth for the sphenoidal process. At the time of birth, the height of the vertical part is about equal to the transverse width of the horizontal part, whereas in the adult the former measures about twice as much as the latter. Articulations The palatine articulates with six bones, the sphenoid, ethmoid, maxilla, inferior nasal concha, vomer, and opposite palatine. End of section 28twenty nine of Gray's Anatomy Part one This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org Anatomy of the Human Body Part one by Henry Gray Section twenty nine The Inferior Nasal Concha The Voma Concha nasalis inferior, inferior turbinated bone. The inferior nasal concha extends horizontally along the lateral wall of the nasal cavity and consists of a lamina of spongy bone curled upon itself like a scroll. It has two surfaces, two borders and two extremities. The medial surface is convex perforated by numerous apertures and traversed by longitudinal grooves for the lodgment of vessels. The lateral surface is concave and forms part of the inferior meatus. Its upper border is thin, irregular and connected to various bones along the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. It may be divided into three portions. Of these, the anterior articulates with the conchal crest of the maxilla the posterior with the conchal crest of the palatine. The middle portion represents three well-marked processes, which vary much in their size and form. Of these, the anterior or lacrimal process is small and pointed, and is situated at the junction of the anterior fourth with the posterior three-fourths of the bone. It articulates by its apex with the descending process of the lacrimal bone, and by its margins with the groove on the back of the frontal processes of the maxilla, and thus assists in forming the canal for the nasolacrimal duct. Behind this process, a broad, thin plate, the ethmoidal process, ascends to join the uncinate process of the ethmoid. From its lower border, a thin lamina, the maxillary process, curves downward and lateralward. It articulates with the maxilla, and forms a part of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus. The inferior border is free, thick and cellular in structure, more especially in the middle of the bone. Both extremities are more or less pointed, the posterior being the more tapering. Ossification The inferior nasal concha is ossified from a single centre, which appears about in the fifth month of fetal life 
in the lateral wall of the cartilaginous nasal capsule. Articulations The inferior nasal concha articulates with four bones, the ethmoid, maxilla, lacrimal, and palatine. 5B7 The Voma The Voma is situated in the median plane but its anterior portion is frequently bent to one or other side. It is thin, somewhat quadrilateral in shape, and forms the hinder and lower parts of the nasal septum. It has two surfaces and four borders. The surfaces are marked by small furrows for blood vessels, and on each is the nasopalatine groove, which runs obliquely downward and forward, and lodges the nasopalatine nerve and vessels. The superior border, the thickest, presents a deep furrow, bounded on either side by a horizontal projecting ala of bone. The furrow receives the rostrum of the sphenoid, while the margins of the ala articulate with the vaginal process of the medial pterygoid plates of the sphenoid behind and with the sphenoidal process of the palatine bones in front. The inferior border articulates with the crest formed by the maxilla and palatine bones. The anterior border is the longest and slopes downward and forward. Its upper half is fused with the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. Its lower half is grooved for the inferior margin of the septal cartilage of the nose. The posterior border is free, concave, and separates the coani. It is thick and bifid above, thin below. Ossification. At an early period, the septum of the nose consists of a plate of cartilage, the ethmovomerian cartilage. The postero superior part of this cartilage is ossified to form the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. Its antero inferior portion persists as the septal cartilage while the voma is ossified in the membrane covering its posterior inferior part. Two ossific centres, one on either side of the middle line, appear about the eighth week of fetal life in this part of the membrane, and hence the voma consists primarily of two lamellae. About the third month these unite below, and thus a deep groove is formed in which the cartilage is lodged. As growth proceeds, the union of the lamellae extend upward and forward, and at the same time the intervening plate of cartilage undergoes absorption. By the age of puberty, the lamellae are almost completely united to form a median plate. But evidence of the bilaminar origin of the bone is seen in the inverted ailey of its upper border and the groove on its anterior margin. Articulation the voma articulates with six bones, two of the cranium, the sphenoid and ethmoid, and four of the face, the two maxillae and two palatine bones. It also articulates with the septal cartilage of the nose. End of section 29. Section 30 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray. The Mandible. 5B, Part 8. The Mandible, Lower Jaw. Inferior Maxillary Bone. The mandible, the largest and strongest bone of the face, serves for the reception of the lower teeth. It consists of a curved horizontal portion, the body, and two perpendicular portions, the rami, which unite with the ends of the body nearly at right angles. The body, corpus mandibuli. The body is curved somewhat like a horseshoe and has two surfaces and two borders. Surfaces. The external surface is marked in the median line by a faint ridge indicating the symphysis or line of junction of the two pieces of which the bone is composed at an early period of life. This ridge divides below and encloses a triangular eminence, 
the mental protuberance, the base of which is depressed in the center, but raised on either side to form the mental tubercle. On either side of the symphysis, just below the incisor teeth, is a depression, the incisive fossa, which gives origin to the mentalis and a small portion of the orbicularis oris. Below the second premolar tooth on either side, midway between the upper and lower borders of the body, is the mental foramen, for the passage of the mental vessels and nerve. Running backward and upward from each mental tubercle is a faint ridge, the oblique line, which is continuous with the anterior border of the ramus. It affords attachment to the quadratus labi inferioris and triangularis. The platysma is attached below it. The internal surface is concave from side to side. Near the lower part of the symphysis is a pair of laterally placed spines, termed the mental spines, which give origin to the genioglossi. Immediately below these is a second pair of spines, or more frequently a median ridge or impression, for the origin of the geniohyoidei. In some cases the mental spines are fused to form a single eminence, in others they are absent and their position is indicated merely by an irregularity of the surface. Above the mental spines a median foramen and furrow are sometimes seen. They mark the line of union of the halves of the bone. Below the mental spines, on either side of the middle line, is an oval depression for the attachment of the anterior belly of the digastricus. Extending upward and backward on either side from the lower part of the symphysis is the myeloid line, which gives origin to the mylohyoideus. The posterior part of this line, near the alveolar margin, gives attachment to a small part of the constrictor pharyngeus superior, and to the pterygomandibular raphi. Above the anterior part of this line is a smooth triangular area against which the sublingual gland rests, and below the hinder part, an oval fossa for the submaxillary gland. Borders. The superior or alveolar border, wider behind than in front, is hollowed into cavities for the reception of the teeth. These cavities are sixteen in number, and vary in depth and size according to the teeth which they contain. To the outer lip of the superior border on either side, the buccinator is attached as far forward as the first molar tooth. The inferior border is rounded, longer than the superior, and thicker in front than behind. At the point where it joins the lower border of the ramus a shallow groove, for the external maxillary artery may be present. The ramus ramus mandibuli, perpendicular portion. The ramus is quadrilateral in shape and has two surfaces, four borders, and two processes. Surfaces. The lateral surface is flat and marked by oblique ridges at its lower part. It gives attachment throughout nearly the whole of its extent to the masseter. The medial surface presents about its center the oblique mandibular foramen for the entrance of the inferior alveolar vessels and nerve. The margin of this opening is irregular. It presents in front a prominent ridge, surmounted by a sharp spine, the lingula mandibuli, which gives attachment to the sphenomandibular ligament. At its lower and back part is a notch from which the myeloid groove runs obliquely downward and forward and lodges the myeloid vessels and nerve. Behind this groove is a rough surface for the insertion of the pterygoideus internus. The mandibular canal runs obliquely downward and forward in the ramus, and then horizontally forward in the body, where it is placed under the alveoli and communicates with them by small openings. On arriving at the incisor teeth, it turns back to communicate with the mental foramen, giving off two small canals which run to the cavities containing the incisor teeth. In the posterior two-thirds of the bone, the canal is situated nearer the internal surface of the mandible, and in the anterior third, nearer its external surface. It contains the inferior alveolar vessels and nerve from which branches are distributed to the teeth. The lower border of the ramus is thick, straight, and continuous with the inferior border of the body of the bone. At its junction with the posterior border is the angle of the mandible, which may be either inverted or everted, and is marked by rough, oblique ridges on each side for the attachment of the masseter laterally 
and the pterygoideus internus medially. The stylomandibular ligament is attached to the angle between these muscles. The anterior border is thin above, thicker below, and continuous with the oblique line. The posterior border is thick, smooth, rounded, and covered by the parotid gland. The upper border is thin and is surmounted by two processes, the coronoid in front and the condyloid behind, separated by a deep concavity, the mandibular notch. The coronoid process, processus coronoideus, is a thin triangular eminence which is flattened from side to side and varies in shape and size. Its anterior border is convex and is continuous below with the anterior border of the ramus. Its posterior border is concave and forms the anterior boundary of the mandibular notch. Its lateral surface is smooth and affords insertion to the temporalis and masseter. Its medial surface gives insertion to the temporalis and presents a ridge which begins near the apex of the process and runs downward and forward to the inner side of the last molar tooth. Between this ridge and the anterior border is a grooved triangular area, the upper part of which gives attachment to the temporalis, the lower part to some fibers of the buccinator. The condyloid process, processus condyloideus, is thicker than the coronoid and consists of two portions, the condyle and the constricted portion which supports it, the neck. The condyle presents an articular surface for articulation with the articular disc of the temporomandibular joint. It is convex from before backward and from side to side, and extends farther on the posterior than on the anterior surface. Its long axis is directed medial word and slightly backward, and if prolonged to the middle line will meet that of the opposite condyle near the anterior margin of the foramen magnum. At the lateral extremity of the condyle is a small tubercle for the attachment of the temporomandibular ligament. The neck is flattened from before backward and strengthened by ridges which descend from the forepart and sides of the condyle. Its posterior surface is convex, its anterior presents a depression for the attachment of the pterygoideus externus. The mandibular notch, separating the two processes, is a deep semilunar depression and is crossed by the mesoteric vessels and nerve. Ossification The mandible is ossified in the fibrous membrane covering the outer surfaces of Meckel's cartilages. These cartilages form the cartilaginous bar of the mandibular arch and are two in number, a right and a left. Their proximal or cranial ends are connected with the ear capsules, and their distal extremities are joined to one another at the symphysis by mesodermal tissue. They run forward immediately below the condyles and then, bending downward, lie in a groove near the lower border of the bone. In front of the canine tooth they incline upward to the symphysis. From the proximal end of each cartilage, the malleus and incus, two of the bones of the middle ear, are developed. The next succeeding portion, as far as the lingula, is replaced by fibrous tissue, which persists to form the sphenomandibular ligament. Between the lingula and the canine tooth the cartilage disappears, while the portion of it below and behind the incisor teeth becomes ossified and incorporated with this part of the mandible. Ossification takes place in the membrane covering the outer surface of the ventral end of Meckel's cartilage and each half of the bone is formed from a single center which appears, near the mental foramen, about the sixth week of fetal life. By the tenth week, the portion of Meckel's cartilage which lies below and behind the incisor teeth is surrounded and invaded by the membrane bone. Somewhat later, accessory nuclei of cartilage make their appearance, viz. a wedge-shaped nucleus in the condyloid process, and extending downward through the ramus, a small strip along the anterior border of the coronoid process, and smaller nuclei in the front part of both alveolar walls and along the front of the lower border of the bone. These accessory nuclei possess no separate ossific centers, but are invaded by the surrounding membrane bone and undergo absorption. The inner alveolar border, usually described as arising from a separate ossific center, splenial center, is formed in the human mandible by an ingrowth from the main mass of the bone. At birth the bone consists of two parts, united by a fibrous symphysis 
in which ossification takes place during the first year. The foregoing description of the ossification of the mandible is based on the researches of Lowe and Fawcett, and differs somewhat from that usually given. Articulations. The mandible articulates with the two temporal bones. Changes produced in the mandible by age. At birth, the body of the bone is a mere shell, containing the sockets of the two incisor, the canine, and the two deciduous molar teeth, imperfectly partitioned off from one another. The mandibular canal is of large size, and runs near the lower border of the bone. The mental foramen opens beneath the socket of the first deciduous molar tooth. The angle is obtuse, 175 degrees, and the condyloid portion is nearly in line with the body. The coronoid process is of comparatively large size, and projects above the level of the condyle. After birth, the two segments of the bone become joined at the symphysis, from below upward, in the first year but a trace of separation may be visible in the beginning of the second year, near the alveolar margin. The body becomes elongated in its whole length, but more especially behind the mental foramen, to provide space for the three additional teeth developed in this part. The depth of the body increases owing to increased growth of the alveolar part, to afford room for the roots of the teeth, and by thickening of the subdental portion which enables the jaw to withstand the powerful action of the masticatory muscles. But the alveolar portion is the deeper of the two, and consequently the chief part of the body lies above the oblique line. The mandibular canal, after the second dentition, is situated just above the level of the myeloid line, and the mental foramen occupies the position usual to it in the adult. The angle becomes less obtuse, owing to the separation of the jaws by the teeth. About the fourth year, it is 140 degrees. In the adult, the alveolar and subdental portions of the body are usually of equal depth. The mental foramen opens midway between the upper and lower borders of the bone, and the mandibular canal runs nearly parallel with the myeloid line. The ramus is almost vertical in direction the angle measuring from 110 to 120 degrees. In old age, the bone becomes greatly reduced in size, for with the loss of the teeth, the alveolar process is absorbed, and consequently the chief part of the bone is below the oblique line. The mandibular canal, with the mental form and opening from it, is close to the alveolar border. The ramus is oblique in direction, the angle measures about 140 degrees, and the neck of the condyle is more or less bent backward. 5b, section 9, the hyoid bone. Os hyoidium, lingual bone. The hyoid bone is shaped like a horseshoe, and is suspended from the tips of the styloid processes of the temporal bones by the styloid ligaments. It consists of five segments, viz., a body, two greater cornua, and two lesser cornua. The body, or basa heel, corpus os hyoidei. The body, or central part, is of a quadrilateral form. Its anterior surface is convex and directed forward and upward. It is crossed in its upper half by a well-marked transverse ridge with a slight downward convexity, and in many cases a vertical median ridge divides it into two lateral halves. The portion of the vertical ridge above the transverse line is present in a majority of specimens, but the lower portion is evident only in rare cases. The anterior surface gives insertion to the geniohyoideus in the greater part of its extent, both above and below the transverse ridge. A portion of the origin of the hyoglossus notches the lateral margin of the geniohyoideus attachment. Below the transverse ridge, the mylohoideus, sternohoideus, and omohoideus are inserted. The posterior surface is smooth, concave, directed backward and downward, and separated from the epiglottis by the hyothyroid membrane and a quantity of loose areolar tissue. A bursa intervenes between it and the hyothyroid membrane. The superior border is rounded and gives attachment to the hyothyroid membrane and some aponeurotic fibers of the genioglossus. The inferior border affords insertion medially to the sternohyoideus 
and laterally to the omohoideus, and occasionally a portion of the thyrohoideus. It also gives attachment to the levator glanduli thyroidei, when this muscle is present. In early life, the lateral borders are connected to the greater cornua by synchondroses, after middle life usually by bony union. The greater cornua, or thyrohyals, cornua majora. The greater cornua project backward from the lateral borders of the body. They are flattened from above downward and diminish in size from before backward. Each ends in a tubercle to which is fixed the lateral hyothyroid ligament. The upper surface is rough close to its lateral border for muscular attachments. The largest of these are the origins of the hyoglossus and constrictor pharyngeus medius, which extend along the whole length of the cornu. The digastricus and stylohyoideus have small insertions in front of these near the junction of the body with the cornu. To the medial border, the hyothyroid membrane is attached, while the anterior half of the lateral border gives insertion to the thyrohyoideus. The lesser cornua, or serotohyals, cornua minora. The lesser cornu are two small conical eminences attached by their bases to the angles of junction between the body and greater cornua. They are connected to the body of the bone by fibrous tissue and occasionally to the greater cornua by distinct diarthrodial joints, which usually persist throughout life, but occasionally become ankylosed. The lesser cornea are situated in the line of the transverse ridge on the body, and appear to be morphological continuations of it. The apex of each cornea gives attachment to the stylohyoid ligament. Footnote. These ligaments in many animals are distinct bones, and in man may undergo partial ossification. End footnote. The chondroglossus rises from the medial side of the base. Ossification. The hyoid is ossified from six centers, two for the body and one for each cornu. Ossification commences in the greater cornua toward the end of fetal life, in the body shortly afterward, and in the lesser cornua during the first or second year after birth. End of section 30. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Section 31 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray. The Exterior of the Skull, Part 1. The skull as a whole may be viewed from different points, and the views so obtained are termed the normae of the skull. Thus, it may be examined from above, norma verticalis, from below, norma basalis, from the side, norma lateralis, from behind, norma occipitalis, or from the front, norma frontalis. Norma verticalis. When viewed from above, the outline presented varies greatly in different skulls. In some it is more or less oval, in others more nearly circular. The surface is traversed by three sutures, viz. 1. The coronal sutures, nearly transverse in direction, between the frontal and parietals. 2. The sagittal sutures, medially placed, between the parietal bones, and deeply serrated in its anterior two-thirds. And 3 the upper part of the lambdoidal suture, between the parietals and the occipital. The point of junction of the sagittal and coronal suture is named the bregma. That of the sagittal and lambdoid sutures, the lambda. They indicate respectively the positions of the anterior and posterior fontanelles in the fetal skull. On either side of the sagittal suture are the parietal eminence and parietal foramen. The latter, however, is frequently absent on one or both sides. The skull is often somewhat flattened in the neighbourhood of the parietal foramina, and the term obelian is applied to that point of the sagittal suture which is on a level with the foramina. In front is the glabella, and on its lateral aspects are the superciliary arches, and above these the frontal eminences. Immediately above the glabella may be seen the remains of the frontal suture, 
In a small percentage of skulls, this suture persists and extends along the middle line to the bregma. Passing backward and upward from the zygomatic processes of the frontal bone are the temporal lines, which mark the upper limits of the temporal fossae. The zygomatic arches may or may not be seen projecting beyond the anterior portion of these lines. Norma basalis The inferior surface of the base of the skull, exclusive of the mandible, is bounded in front by the incisor teeth in the maxillae, behind by the superior nuchal lines of the occipital, and laterally by the alveolar arch, the lower border of the zygomatic bone, the zygomatic arch, and an imaginary line extending from it to the mastoid process and extremity of the superior nuchal line of the occipital. It is formed by the palatine processes of the maxillae and palatine bones, the voma, the pterygoid processes, the undersurfaces of the great wings, spinous processes, and part of the body of the sphenoid, the undersurfaces of the squamae and mastoid and petrous portions of the temporals, and the undersurface of the occipital bone. The anterior part or hard palate projects below the level of the rest of the surface, and is bounded in front and laterally by the alveolar arch containing the sixteen teeth of the maxillae. Immediately behind the incisor teeth is the incisive foramen. In this foramen are two lateral apertures, the openings of the incisive canals, foramina of Stenson, which transmit the anterior branches of the descending palatine vessels and the nasopalatine nerves. Occasionally, two additional canals are present in the incisive foramen. They are termed the foramina of Scarpa and are situated in the middle line. When present, they transmit the nasopalatine nerves. The vault of the hard palate is concave, uneven, perforated by numerous foramina, marked by depressions for the palatine glands, and traversed by a crucial suture formed by the junction of the four bones of which it is composed. In the young skull a suture may be seen extending on either side from the incisive foramen to the interval between the lateral incisor and canine teeth, and marking off the os incisivum or premaxillary bone. At either posterior angle of the hard palate is the greater palatine foramen for the transmission of the descending palatine vessels and anterior palatine nerve, and running forward and medialward from it is a groove, for the same vessels and nerve. Behind the posterior palatine foramen is the pyramidal process of the palatine bone, perforated by one or more lesser palatine foramina, and marked by the commencement of a transverse ridge, for the attachment of the tenderness expansion of the tensor veli palatini. Projecting backward from the centre of the posterior border of the hard palate is the posterior nasal spine, for the attachment of the musculus uvulae. Behind and above the hard palate are the coni, measuring about 2.5 cm in their vertical and 1.25 cm in their transverse diameters. They are separated from one another by the voma, and each is bounded above by the body of the sphenoid, below by the horizontal part of the palatine bone, and laterally by the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid. At the superior border of the voma may be seen the expanded ally of this bone, receiving between them the rostrum of the sphenoid. Near the lateral margins of the ally of the voma, at the roots of the pterygoid processes, are the pharyngeal canals. The pterygoid process presents near its base the pterygoid canal for the transmission of a nerve and artery. The medial pterygoid plate is long and narrow. On the lateral side of its base is the scaphoid fossa, for the origin of the tensor veli palatini, and at its lower extremity the hamulus, around which the tendon of this muscle turns. The lateral pterygoid plate is broad, its lateral surface forms the medial boundary of the infratemporal fossa, and affords attachment of the pterygoideus externus. Behind the nasal cavities is the basilar portion of the occipital bone, presenting near its centre the pharyngeal tubercle for the attachment of the fibrous raphae of the pharynx, with depressions on either side for the insertions of the rectus capitis anterior and longus capitis. At the base of the lateral pterygoid plate is the foramen ovale, for the transmission of the mandibular nerve, the accessory meningeal artery, and sometimes the lesser superficial petrosal nerve. Behind this are the foramen spinosum, which transmits the middle meningeal vessels, and the prominent spina angularis, sphenoidal spine, which gives attachment to the sphenomandibular ligament and the tensor veli palatini. Lateral to the spina angularis is the mandibular fossa, divided into two parts by the petrotympanic fissure, the anterior portion, concave, smooth, bounded in front by the articular tubercle, 
serves for the articulation of the condyle of the mandible. The posterior portion, rough and bounded behind by the tympanic part of the temporal, is sometimes occupied by a part of the parotid gland. Emerging from between the laminae of the vaginal process of the tympanic part is the styloid process, and at the base of this process is the stylomastoid foramen for the exit of the facial nerve and entrance of the stylomastoid artery. Lateral to the stylomastoid foramen, between the tympanic part and the mastoid process, is the tympanomastoid fissure, for the auricular branch of the vagus. Upon the medial side of the mastoid process is the mastoid notch, for the posterior belly of the digastricus, and medial to the notch, the occipital groove for the occipital artery. At the base of the medial pterygoid plate is a large and somewhat triangular aperture, the foramen lacerum, bounded in front by the great wing of the sphenoid, behind by the apex of the petrous portion of the temporal bone, and medially by the body of the sphenoid and basilar portion of the occipital bone. It presents in front the posterior orifice of the pterygoid canal, behind the aperture of the carotid canal. The lower part of this opening is filled up in the fresh state by a fibrocartilaginous plate, across the upper or cerebral surface of which the internal carotid artery passes. Lateral to this aperture is a groove, the sulcus tubi auditivi, between the petrous part of the temporal and the great wing of the sphenoid. This sulcus is directed lateralward and backward from the root of the medial pterygoid plate and lodges the cartilaginous part of the auditory tube. It is continuous behind with the canal in the temporal bone which forms the bony part of the same tube. At the bottom of this sulcus is a narrow cleft, the petrosphenoidal fissure, which is occupied, in the fresh condition, by a plate of cartilage. Behind this fissure is the undersurface of the petrous portion of the temporal bone, presenting, near its apex, the quadrilateral rough surface, part of which affords attachment to the levator veli palatini. Lateral to this surface is the orifice of the carotid canal, and medial to it, the depression leading to the aqueductus cochlei, the former transmitting the internal carotid artery and the carotid plexus of the sympathetic, the latter serving for the passage of a vein from the cochlea. Behind the carotid canal is the jugular foramen, a large aperture formed in front by the petrous portion of the temporal and behind by the occipital. It is generally larger on the right than on the left side, and may be subdivided into three compartments. The anterior compartment transmits the inferior petrosal sinus, the intermediate, the glossopharyngeal, vagus, and accessory nerves, the posterior, the transverse sinus, and some meningeal branches from the occipital and ascending pharyngeal arteries. On the ridge of bone dividing the carotid canal from the jugular foramen is the inferior tympanic canaliculus for the transmission of the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve, and on the wall of the jugular foramen, near the root of the styloid process, is the mastoid canaliculus for the passage of the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. Extending forward from the jugular foramen to the foramen lacerum is the petrooccipital fissure, occupied in the fresh state by a plate of cartilage. Behind the basilar portion of the occipital bone is the foramen magnum, bounded laterally by the occipital condyles, the medial sides of which are rough for the attachment of the alar ligaments. Lateral to each condyle is the jugular process which gives attachment to the rectus capitis lateralis muscle and the lateral atlanto-occipital ligament. The foramen magnum transmits the medulla oblongata and its membranes, the accessory nerves, the vertebral arteries, the anterior and posterior spinal arteries, and the ligaments connecting the occipital bone with the axis. The midpoints on the anterior and posterior margins of the foramen magnum are respectively termed the basion and the opistheon. In front of each condyle is the canal for the passage of the hypoglossal nerve and a meningeal artery. Behind each condyle is the condyloid fossa, perforated on one or both sides by the condyloid canal for the transmission of a vein from the transverse sinus. Behind the foramen magnum is the medium neutral line, extending above at the external occipital protuberance, while on either side are the superior and inferior neutral lines. These, as well as the surfaces of the bone between them, are rough for the attachment of the muscles which are enumerated on pages 129 and 130. Norma lateralis. When viewed from the side, the skull is seen to consist of the cranium above and behind, and of the face below and in front. The cranium is somewhat ovoid in shape, but its contour varies in different cases and depends largely on the length and height of the skull and on the degree of prominence of the superciliary arches and frontal eminences.
entering into its formation are the frontal the parietal the occipital the temporal and the great wing of the sphenoid these bones are joined to one another and to the zygomatic by the following sutures the zygomatico temporal between the zygomatic process of the temporal and the temporal process of the zygomatic the zygomatico frontal uniting the zygomatic bone with the zygomatic process of the frontal the sutures surrounding the great wing of the sphenoid viz the sphenozygomatic in front the sphenofrontal and sphenoparietal above and the sphenosquamosal behind the sphenoparietal suture varies in length in different skulls and is absent in those cases where the frontal articulates with the temporal squama. The point corresponding with the posterior end of the sphenoparietal suture is named the pterion. It is situated about three centimetres behind and a little above the level of the zygomatic process of the frontal bone. The squamosal suture arches backward from the pterion and connects the temporal squama with the lower border of the parietal. This suture is continuous behind with the short, nearly horizontal parietomastoid suture, which unites the mastoid process of the temporal with the region of the mastoid angle of the parietal. Extending from above downward and forward across the cranium are the coronal and lambdoidal sutures. The former connects the parietals with the frontal, the latter the parietals with the occipital. The lambdoidal suture is continuous below with the occipital mastoid suture between the occipital and mastoid portion of the temporal. In or near the last suture is the mastoid foramen, for the transmission of an emissary vein. The point of meeting of the parietomastoid, occipitomastoid and lambdoidal sutures is known as the asterion. Immediately above the orbital margin is the superciliary arch, and at a higher level the frontal eminence. Near the centre of the parietal bone is the parietal eminence. Posteriorly is the external occipital protuberance, from which the superior nuchal line may be followed forward to the mastoid process. Arching across the side of the cranium are the temporal lines, which mark the upper limit of the temporal fossa. The temporal fossa, fossa temporalis. The temporal fossa is bounded above and behind by the temporal lines, which extend from the zygomatic process of the frontal bone upward and backward across the frontal and parietal bones, and then curve downward and forward to become continuous with the supramastoid crest and the posterior root of the zygomatic arch. The point where the upper temporal line cuts the coronal suture is named the Stephanion. The temporal fossa is bounded in front by the frontal and zygomatic bones, and opening on the back of the latter is the zygomatico-temporal foramen. Laterally, the fossa is limited by the zygomatic arch, formed by the zygomatic and temporal bones. Below, it is separated from the infratemporal fossa by the infratemporal crest on the great wing of the sphenoid, and by a ridge, continuous with this crest, which is carried backward across the temporal squamer to the anterior root of the zygomatic process. In front and below, the fossa communicates with the orbital cavity through the inferior orbital or sphenomaxillary fissure. The floor of the fossa is deeply concave in front and convex behind, and is formed by the zygomatic, frontal, parietal, sphenoid and temporal bones. It is traversed by vascular furrows. One, usually well marked, runs upwards above and in front of the external acoustic meatus and lodges the middle temporal artery. Two others, frequently indistinct, may be observed on the anterior part of the floor and are for the anterior and posterior deep temporal arteries. The temporal fossa contains the temporalis muscle and its vessels and nerves, together with the zygomatico-temporal nerve. The zygomatic arch is formed by the zygomatic process of the temporal and the temporal process of the zygomatic, the two being united by an oblique suture. The tendon of the temporalis passes medial to the arch to gain insertion into the coronoid process of the mandible. The zygomatic process of the temporal arises by two roots, an anterior directed inward in front of the mandibular fossa, where it expands to form the articular tubercle, and a posterior, which runs backwards above the external acoustic meatus and is continuous with the supramastoid crest. The upper border of the arch gives attachment to the temporal fascia. The lower border and medial surface give origin to the masseter. Below the posterior root of the zygomatic arch is the elliptical orifice of the external acoustic meatus, bounded in front, below and behind by the tympanic part of the temporal bone. To its outer margin the cartilaginous segment of the external acoustic meatus is attached. 
the small triangular area between the posterior root of the zygomatic arch and the posterior superior part of the orifice is termed the supramiatal triangle on the anterior border of which a small spinous process the supramiatal spine is sometimes seen between the tympanic part and the articular tubercle is the mandibular fossa divided into two parts by the petrotympanic fissure the anterior and larger part of the fossa articulates with the condyle of the mandible and is limited behind by the external acoustic meatus. The posterior part sometimes lodges a portion of the parotid gland. The styloid process extends downward and forward for a variable distance from the lower part of the tympanic part and gives attachment to the styloglossus, stylohyoideus and stylopharyngeus, and to the stylohyoid and stylomandibular ligaments. Projecting downward behind the external acoustic meatus is the mastoid process, to the outer surface of which the sternocleidomastoideus, splenius capitis, and longissimus capitis are attached. End of section number 31《of Grey's Anatomy, Part 1 》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray The Exterior of the Skull, Part 2 The Infratemporal Fossa Fossa Infratemporalis, Zygomatic Fossa The Infratemporal Fossa is an irregularly shaped cavity, situated below and medial to the zygomatic arch. It is bounded, in front, by the infratemporal surface of the maxilla and the ridge which descends from its zygomatic process, behind, by the articular tubercle of the temporal and the spinal angularis of the sphenoid, above, by the great wing of the sphenoid below the infratemporal crest, and by the undersurface of the temporal squama, below, by the alveolar border of the maxilla, medially by the lateral pterygoid plate. It contains the lower part of the temporalis, the pterygoidea internus and externus, the internal maxillary vessels, and the mandibular and maxillary nerves. The foramen ovale and foramen spinosum open on its roof, and the alveolar canals on its anterior wall. At its upper and medial part are two fissures, which together form a T-shaped fissure, the horizontal limb being named the inferior orbital, and the vertical one the pterygomaxillary. The inferior orbital fissure, fissura orbitalis inferior, sphenomaxillary fissure, horizontal in direction, opens into the lateral and back part of the orbit. It is bounded above by the lower border of the orbital surface of the great wing of the sphenoid, below by the lateral border of the orbital surface of the maxilla and the orbital process of the palatine bone, laterally by a small part of the zygomatic bone. Note 48. Occasionally the maxilla and the sphenoid articulate with each other at the interior extremity of this fissure. The zygomatic is then excluded from it. Medially it joins at right angles with the pterygomaxillary fissure. Through the inferior orbital fissure, the orbit communicates with the temporal, infratemporal, and pterygopalatine fossae. The fissure transmits the maxillary nerve and its zygomatic branch, the infraorbital vessels, the ascending branches from the sphenopalatine ganglion, and a vein which connects the inferior ophthalmic vein with the pterygoid venous plexus. The pterygomaxillary fissure is vertical and descends at right angles from the medial end of the preceding. It is a triangular interval formed by the divergence of the maxilla from the pterygoid process of the sphenoid. It connects the infratemporal with the pterygopalatine fossa and transmits the terminal part of the internal maxillary artery. The pterygopalatine fossa Fossa pterygopalatina, sphenomaxillary fossa The pterygopalatine fossa is a small, triangular space at the angle of junction of the inferior orbital and pterygomaxillary fissures and placed beneath the apex of the orbit. It is bounded above by the undersurface of the body of the sphenoid and by the orbital process of the palatine bone, in front by the infratemporal surface of the maxilla, behind 
by the base of the pterygoid process and lower part of the anterior surface of the great wing of the sphenoid, medially by the vertical part of the palatine bone with its orbital and sphenoidal processes. This fossa communicates with the orbit by the inferior orbital fissure, with the nasal cavity by the sphenopalatine foramen, and with the infratemporal fossa by the pterygomaxillary maxillary fissure. Five foramina open into it. Of these, three are on the posterior wall, viz. the foramen rotundum, the pterygoid canal, and the pharyngeal canal, in this order downward and medialward. On the medial wall is the sphenopalatine foramen, and below is the superior orifice of the pterygopalatine canal. The fossa contains the maxillary nerve, the sphenopalatine ganglion, and the terminal part of the internal maxillary artery. Norma occipitalis when viewed from behind, the cranium presents a more or less circular outline. In the middle line is the posterior part of the sagittal suture connecting the parietal bones. Extending downward and lateralward from the hinder end of the sagittal suture is the deeply serrated lambdoidal suture, joining the parietals to the occipital, and continuous below with the parietomastoid and occipitomastoid sutures. It frequently contains one or more sutural bones. Near the middle of the occipital squamer is the external occipital protuberance, or inion, and extending lateral wood from it on either side is the superior nuchal line, and above this the faintly marked highest nuchal line. The part of the squamer above the inion and highest lines is named the planum occipitale, and is covered by the occipitalis muscle. The part below is termed the planum nucale and is divided by the median nuchal line which runs downward and forward from the inion to the foramen magnum. This ridge gives attachment to the ligamentum nuchae. The muscles attached to the planum nuchale are enumerated on page 130. Below and in front are the mastoid processes, convex laterally and grooved medially by the mastoid notches. In or near the occipitomastoid suture is the mastoid foramen for the passage of the mastoid emissary vein. Norma frontalis When viewed from the front, the skull exhibits a somewhat oval outline, limited above by the frontal bone, below by the body of the mandible, and laterally by the zygomatic bones and the mandibular rami. The upper part, formed by the frontal squamer, is smooth and convex. The lower part, made up of the bones of the face, is irregular. It is excavated laterally by the orbital cavities, and presents in the middle line the anterior nasal aperture leading to the nasal cavities, and below this the transverse slit between the upper and lower dental arcades. Above, the frontal eminences stand out more or less prominently, and beneath these are the superciliary arches, joined to one another in the middle by the glabella, on and above the glabella a trace of the frontal suture sometimes persists. Beneath is the frontal nasal suture, the midpoint of which is termed the nasion. Behind and below the frontal nasal suture the frontal articulates with the frontal process of the maxilla and with the lacrimal. Arching transversely below the superciliary arches is the upper part of the margin of the orbit, thin and prominent in its lateral two-thirds, rounded in its medial third, and presenting at the junction of these two portions the supraorbital notch or foramen for the supraorbital nerve and vessels. The supraorbital margin ends laterally in the zygomatic process which articulates with the zygomatic bone, and from it the temporal line extends upward and backward. Below the frontal nasal suture is the bridge of the nose, convex from side to side, concavo convex from above downward and formed by the two nasal bones supported in the middle line by the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, and laterally by the frontal processes of the maxillae which are prolonged upward between the nasal and lacrimal bones and form the lower and medial part of the circumference of each orbit. Below the nasal bones and between the maxillae is the anterior aperture of the nose, piriform in shape, with the narrow end directed upward. Laterally, this opening is bounded by sharp margins, to which the lateral and alar cartilages of the nose are attached. Below, the margins are thicker and curve medialward and forward to end in the anterior nasal spine. On looking into the nasal cavity, the bony septum which separates the nasal cavities presents, in front, a large triangular deficiency. This, in the fresh state, is filled up by the cartilage of the nasal septum.
on the lateral wall of each nasal cavity the anterior part of the inferior nasal concha is visible below and lateral to the anterior nasal aperture are the anterior surfaces of the maxillae each perforated near the lower margin of the orbit by the infraorbital foramen for the passage of the infraorbital nerve and vessels below and medial to this foramen is the canine eminence separating the incisive from the canine fossa Beneath these fossae are the alveolar processes of the maxillae containing the upper teeth, which overlap the teeth of the mandible in front. The zygomatic bone on either side forms the prominence of the cheek, the lower and lateral portion of the orbital cavity, and the anterior part of the zygomatic arch. It articulates medially with the maxilla, behind with the zygomatic process of the temporal, and above with the great wing of the sphenoid and the zygomatic process of the frontal. It is perforated by the zygomatico-facial foramen for the passage of the zygomatico-facial nerve. On the body of the mandible is a median ridge, indicating the position of the symphysis. This ridge divides below to enclose the mental protuberance, the lateral angles of which constitute the mental tubercles. Below the incisor teeth is the incisive fossa, and beneath the second premolar tooth the mental foramen which transmits the mental nerve and vessels. The oblique line runs upward from the mental tubercle and is continuous behind with the anterior border of the ramus. The posterior border of the ramus runs downward and forward from the condyle to the angle, which is frequently more or less everted. The orbits. The orbits are two quadrilateral pyramidal cavities, situated at the upper and anterior part of the face, their bases being directed forward and lateralward, and their apices backward and medialward, so that their long axes, if continued backward, would meet over the body of the sphenoid. Each presents for examination a roof, a floor, a medial and a lateral wall, a base and an apex. The roof is concave, directed downward and slightly forward, and formed in front by the orbital plate of the frontal, behind by the small wing of the sphenoid. It presents medially the trochlear fovea for the attachment of the cartilaginous pulley of the obliquous oculi superior, laterally the lacrimal fossa for the lacrimal gland, and posteriorly the suture between the frontal bone and the small wing of the sphenoid. The floor is directed upward and lateralward, and is of less extent than the roof. It is formed chiefly by the orbital surface of the maxilla, in front and laterally by the orbital process of the zygomatic bone, and behind and medially, to a small extent, by the orbital process of the palatine. At its medial angle is the upper opening of the nasal lacrimal canal, immediately to the lateral side of which is a depression for the origin of the obliquous oculi inferior. On its lateral part is the suture between the maxilla and zygomatic bone, and at its posterior part that between the maxilla and the orbital process of the palatine. Running forward near the middle of the floor is the infraorbital groove, ending in front in the infraorbital canal and transmitting the infraorbital nerve and vessels. The medial wall is nearly vertical, and is formed from before backward by the frontal process of the maxilla, the lacrimal, the lamina papyracea of the ethmoid, and a small part of the body of the sphenoid in front of the optic foramen. Sometimes the sphenoidal concha forms a small part of this wall. It exhibits three vertical sutures, viz. the lacromaxillary, lacrimoethmoidal, and sphenoethmoidal. In front is seen the lacrimal groove, which lodges the lacrimal sac, and behind the groove is the posterior lacrimal crest, from which the lacrimal part of the orbicularis oculi arises. At the junction of the medial wall and the roof are the frontomaxillary, frontolacrimal, frontoethmoidal, and sphenofrontal sutures. The point of junction of the anterior border of the lacrimal with the frontal is named the dacrion. In the frontoethmoidal suture are the anterior and posterior ethmoidal foramina, the former transmitting the nasociliary nerve and anterior ethmoidal vessels, the latter the posterior ethmoidal nerve and vessels. The lateral wall, directed medialward and forward, is formed by the orbital process of the zygomatic and the orbital surface of the great wing of the sphenoid. These are united by the sphenozygomatic suture which terminates below at the front end of the inferior orbital fissure. On the orbital process of the zygomatic bone are the orbital tubercle, guitinal, and the orifices of one or two canals, which transmit the branches of the zygomatic nerve. Between the roof and the lateral wall, near the apex of the orbit, is the superior orbital fissure. 
through this fissure the oculomotor the trochlea the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal and the adjacent nerves enter the orbital cavity also some filaments from the cavernous plexus of the sympathetic and the orbital branches of the middle meningeal artery passing backward through the fissure are the ophthalmic vein and the recurrent branch from the lacrimal artery to the dura mater the lateral wall and floor are separated posteriorly by the inferior orbital fissure which transmits the maxillary nerve and its zygomatic branch the infraorbital vessels and the ascending branches from the sphenopalatine ganglion the base of the orbit quadrilateral in shape is formed above by the supraorbital arch of the frontal bone in which is supraorbital notch or foramen for the passage of the supraorbital vessels and nerve below by the zygomatic bone and maxilla united by the zygomatical maxillary suture, laterally by the zygomatic bone and the zygomatic process of the frontal, joined by the zygomatical frontal suture, medially by the frontal bone and the frontal process of the maxilla, united by the frontal maxillary suture. The apex, situated at the back of the orbit, corresponds to the optic foramen, a short cylindrical canal which transmits the optic nerve and ophthalmic artery. Some anatomists describe the apex of the orbit as corresponding with the medial end of the superior orbital fissure. It seems better, however, to adopt the statement in the text, since the ocular muscles take origin around the optic foramen and diverge from it to the bulb of the eye. It will thus be seen that there are nine openings communicating with each orbit, viz. the optic foramen, superior and inferior orbital fissures, supraorbital foramen, infraorbital canal, anterior and posterior ethmoidal foramina, zygomatic foramen, and the canal for the nasal lacrimal duct. End of section 32